Today, I'm talking to the insanely talented Sadie Dupuy. This is the second interview we've done. The first one was, I think, in 2016. Uh, if, you're not, if you're not familiar with Sadie Dupuy, here is a short list of her accomplishments. Of course, there are many others. First of all, she is the front person uh, of the band Speedy Ortiz. Uh, she has a solo career under the moniker Sad 13, but she has an MFA in poetry from UMass Amherst, where she also taught. She published her first book of poetry called Mouth Guard in 2018. So she is writing all the time, whether it's songs. Uh, she also edits a poetry journal. I think I forgot to add that as well. Um, whether she's writing songs, poetry, essays, she publishes in a lot of magazines as well. I am a huge fan of her writing, not just as a songwriter, of course, but also as a writer. Uh, she's just a great writer. I always make sure I read her bylines. And as you can see from the interview, um, she's always working on projects of some sort. I don't think there's any downtime with her. Um, stay until the end. Uh, we talk about books, a lot about books. As you can imagine, she is a voracious reader and I always listen to what she's reading because she has great book recommendations, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, poetry. So have out your notebook and take those down, jot those down and buy some of those books. We've read a lot of the same books and I'm just a huge fan of, of anything that she reads because she has great taste. So I uh, hope you enjoy it. Leave your comments. Tell me who you'd like to see in the interview or in later interviews. And check out my website, Songwriters on Process, that features nothing but interviews with songwriters strictly about the songwriting process. So. Interesting about things to talk about because I went back. We talked in 2016. Um, oh, yeah, it's been a while. Which is crazy. I know that it was four years ago. Uh, but we talked a lot about your process, obviously. Um, and I think how you really separated uh, you, your, your poetry writing process and your songwriting process is, was completely separate back then. Like, I think mm -hmm. I asked you, did you ever start to write one thing in one medium and think it might be better in another? Um, so is that still pretty much the case? Do you keep those? Is, is the poetry writing process and the songwriting process completely separate for you? Yeah, those are different projects for me. Um... I think probably I had the same answer now as I did then, which is I yeah. can think of like one time that I took a line from a scrap poem and put it somewhere in a song, but it's not, there's not much overlap for me. With yeah. Those. But it's, but it's, it's deliberative. When you sit down, it's, I'm going to write poetry versus I'm going to write a song kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I do have like, like probably we all do like a running, um, notes thing on my phone where if I think of a cool phrase I'll put it in there yeah. um, and if I'm stuck for something in a song or in a poem I'll definitely check that out and see if there's anything worth adding but um, if I'm writing music the lyrics tend to be the last thing I do um, and I'll be writing to the music so it, it wouldn't it would be hard for me to just write a bunch of words and then try to adapt them to music that's already written yeah um, yeah. So that so if, when you write the music, then this, the music pretty much when you write the songs, the music pretty much comes first. Yeah. So the music kind of dictates what what sorts of lyrics would even work. Yeah. Uh, rhythmically, vowel wise, all that. Yeah. I have to ask you because I love the album titles, and it, I always would say them, and this may be blatantly obvious to other people, but I would always say them, and I would I would try to think foil deer you know, twerp verse, what do these things mean? And I realized they're incredibly poetic phrases. So Thanks. Is, that, are, I mean, is that, I can't be the first person to figure that out, but I was like, cause I was like, fo I really, really foil to your twerp verse. And I kept on saying over, what does this mean? I thought they sound amazing. They are poetic titles. Um, so in Haunted Painting even has that kind of the similar internal rhyme a little bit. So. Is, does, do you do you intentionally go for that the poetic sounds of the titles as well? Yeah, I think I'm I'm usually with anything I publish trying to find words and phrases that sound good or yeah look good to a reader. Yeah. Um, foil deer. What I I used to do a lot of when I talk about it, having a notes thing on my phone that I'll use for poetry or music. Um, something I used to do a lot on tour was in art museums. I would just take a bunch of notes and uh, was able to write a bunch of poetry that way just from, I mean, I think that's a decently common practice. Yeah. Um, so the foil deer was uh, 
a big sculpture of literally a golden deer that I saw in Amsterdam um, on a tour. So I just really loved the image of this golden deer and wanted to use it for now. So I actually had a title for the album before I'd really written any of the album. Yeah. Um, and same deal with Haunted Painting. I was uh, in Seattle for a poetry reading just just over a year ago. And I went to the Fry Gallery and they have, um, why can't I remember anything today? They have one big room that's all these portraits, very, um, they're curated in sort of a congested way that I really like when I go to museums. But there's just tons and tons of these 20th, 19th century portraits. It's a lot of creepy looking women. Um, and there is one, Franz Stuck, I, I think, is, yeah, that's his name. I don't know why I'm pretending I don't remember because I do now. Um, he has a couple paintings in the gallery and there's one of this dancer named Saharit, which I didn't know from looking at the painting. It's not on the title, um, but she, she's kind of an interesting early 20th century figure as well. But I just really loved the painting and it... Um, it, 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 she honestly looks like a vampire in the way that she's portrayed. Yeah. It just has a lot of uh, strange and dark energy attached to it that I was really transfixed by. So I was like, oh, all these paintings are so haunted. Um, and yet again, I was like, oh, haunted painting, what a great title for, for an album. And I sort of had the title right as I was starting to, to write before I'd really done much writing for the album at all. Um, so the art galleries, do you go to art galleries a lot? when you, cause I do that when I travel, I try to go to an art gallery in any city I go to. Yeah, that's um, one of my favorite things to do on tour. Yeah. Obviously it really depends on, I, I think in the early days of doing Speedy when um, it was very much like DIY touring that we'd routed and booked ourselves, it afforded more time to do things like that. Um, especially anytime we're on a support tour, we're like following a bus it doesn't right. really leave time to hang out in the city to check out the museum. But yeah, if there's yeah. ever a day off, that's usually what I'm, you know, museum and like, what's the cool vegan place to eat? <laughs> that's kind yeah. of what I get to do on tour. Um, what, so when you go to these art museums, are you, are those inspirations for, for poems, for songs? Like, are you, are you really, I guess, are you actively, when you go there, are you, it sounds like that those places inspire you to write music, to write poetry as well? Um, to some extent, yeah. If I see something and it inspires a cool phrase, I'll take a note of it, um, yeah. which is something that Saskia Hamilton is a poet that I studied under in undergrad and um, she would always have us go to the MoMA and take notes for poems. And I always liked, liked doing it. It's a, a special, like I have a hard time with activities that feel aimless. I'm not good at just wandering around and taking things in. Um, I have OCD and I feel like it makes it hard for me to just enjoy things for themselves and not feel like everything is homework. Um, yeah. So I think in some ways taking notes at a museum just helps me do a relaxing thing that I might not otherwise make huh. time for. And when you write, and I, you know, you taught writing, I taught writing, we both taught, taught me on the university level. And I would always tell my students that the writing, the, my students, I had a hard time telling my, getting my students to understand that the writing process is always taking place. It's taking place as you're eating, showering, you know, working out, running. It doesn't just take place when you sit down to write and then it ends. So, uh, I mean, is that, is that something that, yeah, what do you think about that, I guess? I mean, is that writing process, sounds like that's always taking place with you. And I get, I guess getting people to understand that idea that it never stops, right? Yeah, I, I think that's fairly true for me as well. Um, I can sort of set aside dedicated time to write, but generally that time is more organizing than actually generative. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why I try to take notes of any ideas that come up. Um, because if I just am sitting down for an hour, I'm going to come up with things, but they might not be the, the great things that come to you while you're unfortunately driving or in the shower or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I do a lot of voice memos and just notes on my phone or in a notebook. Um, and then if I feel like I have the time to, to be working on writing, uh, a lot of it is reviewing and sort of organizing those notes and seeing where I think they could fit with one another and for what project. 
I think that there was an article, it must have been about 10 years ago at this point, the um, creative uh, Dilbert, Scott Adams, I think is his name. He had this article in the Wall Street Journal yeah. about the importance of boredom to the creative process, that we need boredom. Like you were saying, these ideas don't come to us when we're staring you know, at our screen going, what can I write about? They always come to us at the most inopportune times. So do you think it's boredom a necessary component to that writing process, to the, to the I guess, yeah, the, the, the brainstorming, the writing process in general? Um, I don't know if it's boredom necessarily, but I, certainly my brain is more receptive to making things up when it's sort of relaxed or like trance state, um, long highway drives, or I, I got really into, I was swimming a lot a few years ago. Um, you can't listen. I mean, I'm sure you can listen to music while you're swimming now, but I <laughs> did not have a way to do that. So, you know, you spend an hour in water doing something repetitive and rhythmic and you sort of get stuck with ideas. Um, so I do wind up processing a fair amount of stuff when I'm not actively trying to create something. I just interviewed, I posted an interview a couple of days ago with Saver Vaden and he's the guitarist for Jason Isbell. And oh, he cool. grew up in uh, Myrtle Beach, South, South Carolina. And he said the exact same thing you did that he lives in Nashville now, but when he goes back and he gets in the water and he swims in the ocean, full of inspiration, full of mm, ideas. That's cool. Um, and, I, and I don't know, I've heard a lot of people say that because I've had, I, I can't remember if you and I have this conversation, but, I, but the, the shower is a place where so many songwriters come up with ideas. Yeah, um, same. Yeah, I, I, I went back and I couldn't remember if we talked about that, but, but and he said, well, it's nothing more than, it's not, it's not a water thing, it's just because nothing else to do, and you're just kind of going through the motions, you don't have to think about anything. Yeah, um, I, I mean, water, I like being in it, I'm going to give it a couple points just for really? being inspiring, but um, I think being removed from devices is a big uh, creative help. Speaking of writing, then, do you think it's important, do you try to write every day uh and again i have I, like I have gotten into practices like that but i'm not in one right now for me no. it's like it's not a sustainable everyday thing for me i think um i wrote a second manuscript that i am honestly kind of just finishing up and starting to send to people as of this week um but i finished all the writing really thankfully before prior to to quarantine um so I do yeah. not want to be writing coronavirus poems. Right. <laughs> There's going to be enough of that. There will be enough of that, <laughs> um, for sure. But when I was working on it, I would certainly give myself, like, you need to spend a little time on this every single day. And I was able to keep that up for a number of months. Um, but when I'm doing that, for example, with poetry, I'm not really working on music. And then with, like, the, the record that's coming out this year for Sad 13, uh, I wasn't really in a place where I could be writing music every single day, but I set myself certain parameters, like get two songs done a month. Um, right. And that was enough to sort of get by on the deadline I, I wanted to. When I was working on Foil Deer, I was like, I'm going to write a song every day. Um, okay. And there have been times that I've been interested in that. But I think as I've gotten deeper into producing and, and finding that to be its own songwriting tool that's really central to my process, it's, I can't just sit down in an hour and write a song because the programming the drums and the synth is part of the song. And I'm probably going to spend, you know, 20 hours in the DAW just on writing and arranging all the parts, um, which you could certainly wake up at, at 9 a.m. and go to bed at, you know, 5 a.m. the next day. But um, I'm, I'm learning to space it out a little more for the sake of my brain and health. But are there things you do you know, tricks or anything to get yourself in that chair or in that anything to make sure that you write? I mean, when you're not motivated to do it, do you just say, that must be something, like if I'm not motivated, it's not meant to be? Or are there things that you do, like I'm trying to think about things that I do to force myself if I know I have to do it? Yeah, um, I think in the past, yes, but right now I just haven't felt like, if I'm, you know, there's so much going on in the world, I'm not really interested in writing songs about yeah. like my life or experience right now i've definitely been interested in creative projects that support other people's work um i've done some like covers for compilations i've been editing a poetry journal um helping put out johanna's album and milk belly's album um 
But I, if I'm not in the mood to write, I don't feel a pressure to at this point, which is not to say I haven't felt that way in the past and won't feel that way again. Um, but I probably like so many writers of all disciplines, I am much better at setting those stipulations for myself if there's some kind of deadline. Like I knew I wanted to get a Sad 13 album done, which is why I was able to say like, all right, you've got tour dates, but you can definitely write and record at least two songs a month. That's totally doable. Um, and I think once I finish up, there's there's still been stuff to finish up on this album that comes out in September, um, whether that's like art deadlines or trying to do music videos while socially distanced, which has been its own level of insanity. Um, I, I have always felt, even, you know, in years prior, once the music videos are done on the album, like then I'm done and can kind of step away from it. But it's really hard for me to want to work on new projects when I still feel like I'm finishing up the last one. Um, so once the music videos are done, I have all these friends who have sent me tracks that they want me to add to, or that we've been talking about doing a one-off collaboration for years. And I feel like this is a great time to do something like that. Um, and I'm hoping once I'm mentally f sort of freed of the, the burden of like finishing the last project, it'll be more interesting to me to start working on some singles and collaborations and stuff like that. So it's kind of like compartmentalizing then. You mm -hmm. can't work on one thing till. Um, yeah, like it was fine for me to work on a book, but because it wasn't new music. I read this book by, um, and she has a PhD in, edu in education and the book was called your dissertation on 15 minutes a day. And it's not like this new agey type of thing, but it was like, don't look at it as 300 pages, look at it as, I don't know, 10 pages a week for 30 weeks. And I found that to be much more manageable. And with my students, it was the same thing. You know, if you're gonna write your 20 page paper, I know some of you guys are gonna wait till the last minute, but if you have a series of deadlines along the way, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Um... I think, I feel like I'm constantly invoking therapy in conversations about songwriting, why? Um, I, I have OCD and I think sometimes, and I, um, I was diagnosed also with ADHD this year, which was very surprising to me because I was always super academically motivated in school, had no problem hitting deadlines and doing a ton of work. Um, and I don't think I realized that like over giving too much attention to something is also an attention disorder. Um, so I think, you know, OCD and ADHD combined make it so that when I have a task and I have a deadline, it can be really, really hard for me to remove myself from that until I feel like it's done. Um, and it's, it's kind of the same way I work on songwriting and production. Like I mentioned to you, like I can just get lost and I'm pantomiming typing. Um, I can get lost in the, in the project to, the detriment of like other, you know, getting up to use the bathroom. Um, so what to some degree, I think forcing myself to stop and say like, it'll be three days of work rather than continuous work is helpful for me. But um, being self-employed is its own kind of battle. If it was someone else saying like, we need, you know, get the drums program today, tomorrow is your bass and synth day. It's very easy to, for me to adhere to other people's schedules. But when it's when it's self-directed, I have a, a tendency to just want to get it all done and dive into it, which isn't always the healthiest uh, work choice. How important is that ritual? Things you have to have with you, places you need to be, time of day, things like that. Um, it's like not important, but should be. Uh, for instance, if I start working on music, like around this, you know, I'm talking to you, 2.36 p.m., this is too late for me to start something for the day because I will get so excited by it that I will just not go to sleep. And even if I say like, okay, 3 a.m., it's cut off, time to go to bed, my brain is just too wired to do it. Um, so starting on something in the morning is great. And also trying to sort of divide up the tasks. Like, because now I don't, I don't just sit down and write with a guitar. Not that I've totally ever done that, but I, it's not at all true anymore. If before I have done any other note, I'm programming drums for what I think all the sections will be um, based on what I'm hearing in my head. And that alone is like several hours of work. Um, so trying to say like, all right, drums and bass day, start in the morning, stop early enough so that I'm not going to be up all night thinking about wanting to add to it. Uh, th those kinds of like rituals are <laughs> basically making sure I don't start so late that I get too excited. Uh, is a really important one. 
<laughs> is there anything you have to have with you? You know, tea, coffee, I don't know, knickknacks or anything like that? Um, I drink a lot of tea. And my other thing that's like totally stupid, I have a way easier time start, for whatever reason, like, like I have a, a little studio, not, it's not really a studio, but a little workstation in my basement, um, theoretically set up for me to be working on audio related projects. Sometimes just going down there to work feels really overwhelming and stressful and like puts a whole bunch of pressure on it. If I sit on my couch and program the drums or sit, I'm sitting here at my like living room table, um, if, I, if I start from there, it's so much less intimidating to get into a new project. So tricking myself into thinking, I'm not really like starting to work. I'm just, you know, playing around with some, some drum machines um, kind of helps me out. But I'm the same way. I mean, I, and I interviewed uh, John, Don, John Donnell from Mountain Goats. And he told yeah. me that he wrote uh, the last album or two albums ago at the dining room table. And he said, because that's where the mojo was. And I love the dining room table. It's like, it's the best place for me to... To yeah. work, I don't think I'm working, so I get, it doesn't feel scary. Right, but I think we need those things. I think to me, I mean, I feel like it's a level of confidence, you know, that if I've gotten work done there before, I'm more likely to, but absolutely. I find that I write in one place and revise in another. Yep. Yeah, um, once, I, once I start up here, then I'm excited to go down to the basement and continue work. But it's the, the starting, starting is harder than any other part of it for some reason. So you can't, starting in the studio is harder then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But don't you think that's important to know those things? I mean, I, don't you feel that make, if, you, if you're aware of those things, then it just makes it easier? I don't want to become too aware of it because then I'll get scared of working at this table or on my couch. You, I forgot if, we, if you, we talked about this last time, that when you write lyrics first, are you a pen and paper person or a computer person? Um, I've done it both ways. I tend to do the compute. I'm just a better, I'm more articulate typing than I am by hand or by mouth. Um, so I tend to do, do on the computer. And it's also just easier for me to, um, when I print lyrics in the records or CDs, I tend to print them as like prose blocks. Oh, I know. Um, so it's easier for me to like see what word is boring, what phrase could be tweaked if it's written out that way rather than by hand. Um, is the editing process different when you go to edit, when you go to edit poetry? Um, what's that editing, what's the revising process like with poetry? There's a lot more freedom with it than there is in the songwriting because if I am subbing in a word, I still need to make sure that I can sustain the right vowel sound that I'm hearing and that rhythmically, whatever I'm subbing in is gonna work. Um, I'm very constrained to like what the structure of the song is in, in editing songwriting, which in some ways makes it easier. There's only so many options that will fill that slot. Um, with poetry, I tend to write, I tend to overwrite, which I think a lot of us do. Yeah. Um, and I'll just, you know, if I, if, for instance, if I'm forcing myself into a habit of writing poetry, which is a, a little more easier or fun for me than, than songwriting these days, um, I can say like, all right, I'm just going to write for an hour and see what happens. And I might have two or three pages at the end of that. And it's very easy to cut 90% of it. Um, if you do that with a song, then you've just got to start over. Right. Uh, so. Do you sit down with poetry? Do you sit down and, and I guess, are there certain things in poetry, certain topics that inspire you to write a poem or you sit down and say, I need to write a poem about this? Sometimes, but it, um, if anything, it's more, it, it, the way that it is similar to songwriting for me, um, I'm often starting with like a phrase I think is great. Mm. And based on whatever I'm thinking about that day, I'll try to figure out how to get from that phrase to the, to the meaning of um, whatever's on my mind, which isn't hard to do because your mindset's gonna inform um, what you write towards anyway. Yeah. Who are some? I don't. I don't think we. I don't know if we touched on this last time. But who are some of your, you know, who are some of your poetic uh, inspirations? Who are some? Who are some of your favorite poets? Um, I can think of like stuff I'm reading recently that I. Oh, well, yeah. I can think of like contemporary people who I always tend to cite. But um, Dorothy Alasky is a really big one, as is C. A. Conrad, um, Dare Wire, who I studied with, luckily. Um, Morgan Parker is pretty huge for me. Uh, Jenny Zhang put out a book this year that's 
been one of my favorites. Um, I just wrote a thing for WPRB, our semi-local radio station, uh, recommending Don Mitroy, who has a book out this year called DMZ Colony that I really love. And she also does translations of um, the uh, South Korean poet Kim Hyasun, who I love a lot. Um, those are some of my like recent favorites. Melissa Broder, I talk about all the time, um, the way that she sort of transitioned from this amazing poetry to these essays to now fiction is interesting to me. I'm always excited by people who are, um, right, as someone who writes across a couple mediums, yeah. I'm, I'm a fan of other people who can pull it off and she certainly does. Do you did I say Morgan it? Parker? Same deal with her. She yeah, just yeah, did, a, did a YA book this year. Uh, I think that's so cool. Um, do you find that the poetry that you read or the fiction, anything like that, how often do those things, do they ever make their way into any of your songwriting? Um, in very aloof ways, I think, yeah. There's a there's a song on the album that's coming out this year that I was reading, uh, Trick Mirror by Gia Tolentino at the time. Um, and it's, again, a song where I had a melody attached to a line and had sat on that for years but didn't know what the song would be about and kind of turned it into an allegory that's connected to some of the essays in um, Gia's book. So it's, once in a while, yeah, if I have, like, I'm like, oh, I have this great line and it's attached to this melody and I don't know where to go with it. I'll try to, to work it to be <laughs> allegorical for something I'm reading, I guess. So the new album, because I've listened to it, um, the Sad 13 one, um, nice. and I think it's great. Uh, what was the easiest? I've got my list of songs that I that really stood out to me. Um, but, you know, that right, first time I heard them, I said, wow, that's a great song. But what was the... Was there a song in the album that stood out as being the easiest to write? Um, there are a couple that I wrote that I have demos for from a few years before the rest of them. Um, and it might just be the distance from them that makes me think like, those were so easy. Um, but I think both Market Hotel and Take Care, which are both okay. pretty short songs, um, I did, the, I think I did those both pretty quickly, but again, came back to them years later and was able to revise them. So I wasn't starting from zero. Um, so those felt, those I think felt easy. I'm not, it's, <laughs> it's hard for, I feel like I've probably said this to you last time as well, but when I start to write something, I just go into the state of working on it. Um, so it can be hard for me to tell whether like two hours have passed or like the 20 hour example I keep using. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily remember. I can remember like ones that, that felt really difficult for whatever reason. Um, That's my next question. Yeah. <laughs> so what, the, what song on the album, was there a song on the album that stood out as being really, maybe you want to give up, give up on it, but you just push through? I don't ever like to think I'm going to give up on one, but um, The Crow was for whatever reason. Okay. Really, I felt like vexed while writing it. Uh, I, I've never felt like I was possessed by a song before and just trying to exercise it, but I knew I was not going to feel good until that song was done. Um, and I, I got it done and I think it came out cool, but. What was so difficult about it? Just, was there something that wasn't working or? I don't even know how to explain it. Like, you know, when you have, um, like a migraine headache because a storm yeah. coming. Like that's how that song felt to work wow. on. I just did not, I felt cursed and I needed to finish it. And um, it took a few days of pretty intense, intense work. <laughs> so when you start those songs then, you don't, if, you know, if a song's not coming along, you rarely say, do you ever just say, it's clearly not going to happen. I'll just give up on it. Or is I don't think I've ever given up yeah. on one. And often the songs that I work on, it's already an idea I've had in my head for years. And it's a matter of um, just translating it to, to come out as I'm hearing it. Yeah. Um, so sometimes that's very quick. And sometimes that feels like a big challenge as it did with this song. Um, but I, once I get going on it, it's the same. It's like the, the OCD thing I'm talking about. Um, if I start on a project, I don't want to do anything else until it's done. Yeah. Do you have a lot of those, because you mentioned a few minutes ago, kind of those ideas from a few years ago. Do you have a lot of those discarded ideas or lines that you will go back to um, when you're They're not usually something? discarded. It's like, um, it's like I stored it somewhere and, and I'm going to work on it when the time is right to work on that 
particular thing. But yeah, I have a ton of stuff uh, stockpiled for, for future albums. Um, and it'll be fun to get to some of those. There's one song that I've had, <laughs> again, made, made up in the shower. I was on, um, I went to, I went to Buenos Aires with my mom a few years ago, which was really cool. Um, we went kind of not so long after my dad died, just as like, not, they weren't, they hadn't been together my whole life, but it was just like, um, once I lost one parent, realizing I need to, to work more conscientiously to spend time and do these kinds of things with my mom. Um, so I made up this cool song in, in a shower in Buenos Aires, and I have not forgotten it. Uh, and I thought I'd get to it on this album, but um, I got as far as programming drums and just knew it wasn't the right fit for this one. So maybe it'll be a one-off single. I have a fantasy of getting Rachel Eggs to play guitar on it, um, which I think we'll do once. Yeah, it's like a... In my head, it sounds like like um, the English beat or something. Oh, really? Wow. But I just was like, I can't make it work for this album, so yeah. it'll be something for the future. Last question. So fiction, who, do you, who are you reading now? Who do you like to read? Any book recommendations for everyone? I mean, who are some of the people that, because I know you're a voracious mm -hmm. reader. Yeah, let me, I'm trying to think in fiction. I don't know that I've read anything super recently that is a strong recommendation. I've been reading a lot of nonfiction, um, which is probably, I, oh, you know what I did just read that I liked a lot? I, I just pulled up my, my book spreadsheet, which is the only way I remember anything I've done. Um, Sarah Gerard has a new book that just came out called True Love that I oh, like. Right. Um, what else have I read recently in that department? Um, I finally read Home Going by Yagi Azi, which I've had just sitting in my house for a couple years. Um, I'm used to like being able to pick up, pick up books on tour. That's one of the things that I did a tremendous amount of on tour, just seeing what booksellers are recommending in the yeah. indie book shops. And I haven't obviously been in a bookstore since February. Um, I've been able to place a couple online orders from the like bookshops that I'd be supporting anyway. Although one of my favorites has closed. Um, yeah. But it's been, it's been harder for me to figure out what to, what to read without those recommendations. Um, I read Glitter Up the Dark by Sasha Geffen, which is basically talking about, um, queerness and like the gender spectrum across uh pop and rock music since sort of mid 20th century oh really is um, that new yeah it just came out okay some it came out i think in may um one of the U ut austin um they're like music series books what <laughs> What, what words did I just throw at you in a non-coherent way? We'll edit um, it later. <laughs> that um, was really good. Uh, what else? A bunch of semiotext stuff. Sleeveless by Natasha Stagg, which I liked a lot. It was sort of um, essays and I think also somewhat fictionalized essays about her experience working sort of adjacent to fashion and PR in New York in the 2000s. Um, so that was... A, interesting and fun to read um yeah i read uh one of the book, best books i've read in a long time nothing to see here by kevin wilson okay uh, i don't know if you ever heard of it. he's an m he teaches in the mfa program i want to say it warren wilson but i'm not sure um but it is a fantastic book um and it got like this the, the article i found it it was reading the new york times and whoever it was the critic started out by saying, I know I'm supposed to give some objective measure and, and be kind of, you know, be kind of restrained in my praise of this book. But she said it, it was so good. I just, she, like, it was one of the most laudatory reviews that I've read. Cool. Uh, and it, was a, it was a fantastic book. Um, are you able to read more than, I just started doing this. And who was it? I think it, um, one of the songwriters interviewed told me that, that they like to read multiple books at a time because when they, read one, set it aside, and pick up the other one. It gives them time to think about the one that they're not reading. I could never do that before. And I started doing it, and I thought it was amazing. I've um, done it a little bit, and I hadn't done it before this year. But um, I can really only do it if they are very genre divergent. Like if yeah. I, I was reading, um, what did I read at the top of the year? Uh, Duck's New Report, the Lucy Ellman book that's a thousand page run on sentence. 
Um, oh, right. It is just all the thoughts of, you know, the, the woman who's narrating it. Um, and that, that is really, really hard to, it's not only is it a thousand pages continuous run on sentence with just a couple of like, where do you stop? breaks um not only where do you stop but they're like big pages too so it was just yeah. i if i spent a, a long time focusing on it i could do like 30 pages a day max yeah. um so i was reading other things at the time but generally like nonfiction and poetry i can read like a, a non-fiction book and a poetry book at the same time if i yeah. need it from something heavy um or i can read you know same deal with fiction but I, I think two fictional two novels would be tough for me to do at once um yeah no, I shouldn't say I do that.